So hi, Richard. Hello. Good to be here. Hello. What uh, temperature is it in your place at the moment? Uh, the temperature, oh, I don't have a thermometer here, but it should be around 20 something degrees, maybe. Okay. So I'm sitting in a greenhouse right now and uh, oh, okay. my flat says it's 30 degrees in here. So throughout this, uh, throughout the interview, you might start seeing me um, <laughs> get more and more hot <laughs> <laughs> as I survive without fans on for uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, I've got the windows open. Well, one of them and there's a nice breeze. So. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know who I am, because uh, obviously you all know who Richard is, um, I work with Richard across the board on several projects, uh, our DeFi project, banking projects. Um, Richard actually taught me while I was at the University of Southampton. I did my master's and Richard was my supervisor as well for my dissertation. Um, and since then we stayed in close contact and now we work together. So great. So we'll kick off uh, with some easier questions for you, Richard, before we dive into some harder ones. Uh, so I guess, first off, what drove you into economics when you were younger? Well, do you want the real story? <laughs> I think everyone would like yeah, In Japan, they always have the official story and then the real story. <laughs> okay. Okay, the real story is I, I had this plan, and I should really say I have this plan, but I had it since I was maybe 16, 17, to become a novelist and when you read some really good deep novels and, and, and as I did at the time I realized wow these people have seen the world they've seen many places they've met a lot of people they've experienced a lot of things it's pointless as a 17 18 or even 20 year old to try to write a good novel so I've got to see the world so I'm going to study something abroad already and then study something that allows me to work anywhere i'm from a medical family and it at the in those days it was much harder as a medic to move countries because my dad tried and and so and law is usually bound to one country and so on so i thought well i'll do this economics whatever it is and then i can work anywhere <laughs> so there you are <laughs> so you weren't actually extremely passionate about economics at the time it was more for well it was my, my plan to um then see the world thanks to my economics work and then um retire early at some stage and just focus on writing novels i think the the timing is you know the time is approaching so maybe <laughs> um but yeah we'll see get started on it and are any of your family members involved in economics at all or are you a stray dog yeah, no, we're from a medical family, um, so yeah. Okay, great. And the black sheep. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. <laughs> so why do you use professor in your name, someone asked, instead of sort of doctor? Um, well, because I am a professor. Because um, I like, I like the, what, what one of my good friends in Japan told me uh, bef when I wasn't yet professor and I was just, just me, a chief economist of, a, of an investment bank in Tokyo, and he said, no, you've got to become professor because, you see, when you're then engaged in debates and argument, um, what you say will have more weight because the professor is the argument. I see. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, there's lots of uh, professors that talk a lot of rubbish. So I guess, um, you know. This is maybe truer in the in the natural sciences when there's a scientific research methodology being adopted. But that's one of the features that I've adopted in my work mm -hmm. that I decided to do something quite radical for economics. And it is almost blasphemy, heresy, namely to adopt the scientific research method, uh, because I believe that there's no good reason why we should not use the scientific research method also in economics. Obviously, that's a shocking idea, uh, but I've practiced it. And uh, yeah, most economists are therefore quite horrified by my work. But there you go. <laughs> and in fact, that's probably why we got along quite well, because I came over from chemistry, so from the <laughs> science background. And uh, so we related quite well when I was learning it from, from you, um, rather than just being told to assume things were correct. 
which is actually funny enough what one of the other lecturers said to me is that I had to assume things were correct <laughs> and uh, I didn't I didn't appreciate that so <laughs> you're not going to follow in the footsteps of the likes of Peterson then who uh, disagrees with the university structure and how professors are these days or pushing things on students and the negative connotations with it you're not going to follow in that footsteps and drop a professor well no I mean I, I do appreciate criticism and certainly we, we need to take a critical view of almost anything, including universities and how they operate. Um, and so I can understand that th there's a lot of criticism and in many departments and in many universities, there are very unscientific views that are being pushed um, onto students. Whereas I always thought I should give them the facts and the tools, obviously the tools and then also teach them how to think critically for themselves. Um, and as you do that, then, um, you know, let them come to their own conclusions. Obviously I have my views, but they're, you know, they're visible, but the key thing is to learn critical thinking in my view. No, that's good, that's good. And why is there so much obfuscation then around who dominates the global finance space in the world? Why do you think that is? So you're talking now about the actual uh, reality in global finance, not academia, right? <laughs> yeah, we've moved over now from academia <laughs> okay. to uh, more interesting okay. stuff. <laughs> um, well, that's, you know, that's it's very, very obvious that um, if you have a lot of power, you want to keep that power usually. And then the best thing is to, to hide the power because... Um, if it's not even recognized who has the power, then, hey, they can't take it from you. So that's the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very fundamental strategy to do that. It's true. And I guess as well, everyone wants to show off as well. So you'll have some people displaying more power than they've actually got, which complicates things further. Um, right. And, and usually those who, who do the showing off, turns out they're PR people. They don't actually have that much power. They're just hired puppets. But... Um, I mean, you see them a lot on television, so some people wrongly think they must have a lot of power, but um, it's better for those uh, who have the real power not to appear too often on television, I suppose. <laughs> Let's not talk about governments, then. <laughs> Let's not get into that space. <laughs> um, so in your opinion, then, sort of across the world, who do you think the main leader is at the moment? In the main leader in, in, space, in what? In the sort of dominating global finance, their economy. Well, it's quite obvious that, and it's it's that's one of the things that's well recognized and it's not really being denied, uh, fortunately, is that it's the central banks, the central planners at the central banks, because we've witnessed this over the last 40 years or so, that uh, increasingly their powers have, have been uh, strengthened and further increased. They've been given more and more powers and more and more things to do while at the same time they've been made independent and essentially practically unaccountable to democratically elected uh, assemblies. <clears throat> and um, at the same time, we've reduced the powers of governments through deregulation, liberalization and privatization. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> no worries. So on that subject then, um when the sort of ECB strays from their main sort of mandate, if you like, and you've already said they're sort of unaccountable anyway, and that's what one of the sort of audience members was asking about accountability. Who is reviewing it? Who is challenging what they're up to, apart from the public and yourself? Is there any body? Like, well, officially? I mean, of course, I'm not really challenging it, and the public is not either, because we're, we wouldn't break the laws. You know, the law says that it's illegal to criticize the ECB. Do you realize that? It's in the Lisbon Treaty um, and originally was in the Maastricht Treaty. It was originally paragraph 107, then it became 108, I think, uh, which says that the attempt to influence the ECB in any way, and, and here I would add in brackets, such as through good arguments and facts and data and convincing analysis, is illegal according to these treaties so wow so of course certainly we wouldn't engage in such an exercise because you know we stay on the right side of the law don't we uh which sounds very much like a dictatorship when you can't even uh, speak out against them 
um yes very much precisely um that's what it looks like doesn't it <laughs> and um, that was before they introduced far more dictatorial measures like in the last few years or the last year um so you know that was actually formulated in 1993 but they do this you know they did this in a very clever way as they always do in the eu that it was written in you know in the 80s and early 90s but and then passed in 1992 and 1993 but wouldn't essentially come into effect until 10 years later and so that's why people at the time thought well it doesn't matter it's in 10 years time so what you know we don't care mm -hmm. that's how you do it see fair enough um now early as march last year maybe a little bit before that you were tweeting about inflation uh so let's go into that a little bit and you were predicting that um with this crisis that's happening that we're bound to get inflation and you were one of the sort of the first economists if you like um predicting it a lot of people weren't back then and they were ignoring it and you were speaking out against it now it's already signs that inflation is going up more do you believe the official story that it's transitory, um, that it's going to be passing through and, you know, everything's going to be okay? Or do you think it's going to sort of end up more like the 2008 crisis happening? Well, in 2008, we didn't have inflation, um, except asset inflation, of course, but we're talking about consumer price, uh, inflation here. Um, and... Um, so, I mean, my analysis was that there's a big difference to the policies taken by central banks um, in 2020 compared to 2008 to 2009. Namely, there's an expansion in credit creation and broad money and therefore um, affecting also the real economy and therefore consumer prices. And that has panned out. It looks like they've been slowing things down a little bit which is good news because my fear has been since last year that mm -hmm. we're moving towards a, a weimar style you know 1923 style hyperinflation and i think this is still very much on the cards but i would prefer it if if you know that was delayed by a few years because that's a big thing and that does need some preparation for people um, at least those who, who see it and who understand what this means to get ready for it because it's devastating, it's completely devastating. Um, so I was delighted to find that central bank credit creation seems to have slowed a little bit. And therefore, um, at the moment, it looks like, yes, we have inflation and that's probably going to continue, but it's not yet moving into this accelerating scenario where you get higher and higher and higher inflation. And that's good. Um, but I think ultimately that's still on the cards, given the, the, the overall scenario. I mean, you have to look at where we are and what has happened so far and, and, and what central banks have done so far. And so I think it is still one of the core options um, that could be used in order to achieve a number of things, such as, you know, this massive amount of debt that exists and national debt that exists. And, and ultimately, inflation, of course, is a way of getting rid of that um, on the one hand, um, and also dealing with um, some of the goals that, uh, you know, uh, well, the planners like to achieve. Um, including the more strategic and, and long-term goals of rearranging the global financial architecture, mm -hmm. for which, again, big crises, and, you know, we are talking about a major, major crisis, not just like a 2008 one, because, you know, when you get hyperinflation, this really wipes out much of your economy. Um, in Well, a certain part of the economy, the one that is not prepared which usually means ordinary people and the majority of the population and so on. But anyway, it's, it's a major impact. Um, and that's usually quite useful in order to rearrange the global financial architecture, if that's what you're planning to do. And of course, we have a lot of statements saying that, oh, that, that's what they're planning to do. Okay, so that's, you think there's potential that they're trying to cause the crisis for, to have this global rearrangement? Yes, yes, of course, yes. And as you know from my book, Princes of the Yen, 
um, <laughs> shown here. Um, it turns out many crises have been engineered in order to achieve political and economic goals. Um, and, and of course, we know already that the, the 2020 crisis has been due to government overreactions, to put it very mildly. In other words, you know, entirely government um, caused. And therefore, there are clear parallels to what I describe in Princes of the Yen or in the, the documentary that's on YouTube. It's got now 2.7 million viewers. Excellent, excellent. So we are just repeating history a little bit. We haven't learned the mistakes, uh, haven't learned from our mistakes yet. Although I think a lot of people are beginning to learn. Yes, good, yeah. good. Okay, and for people who are then trying to buckle up and sort of look after their savings a little bit, do you have any advice for them? And what sort of good strategy would you suggest without giving financial advice necessarily? <laughs> but yeah, sure. Did you say ordinary savers? Yeah, well, the ordinary person who's got a bit of money saved and they want to look after themselves. Yes, yeah, yeah. It is. It is tricky. Obviously, you know, with inflation becoming an issue, that makes assets and particularly real assets more attractive. So property, real estate, but in some countries they're already in bubble proportions, like, like Germany, where I warned in two thousand nine that that was likely to be the beginning of an asset bubble and that was actually the bottom and then it's been price prices property prices have been rising since um so then of course when it's already very expensive it's kind of tricky but still it's a fact that it's better to have real assets um gold is also attractive the price in my view has been artificially suppressed um but that means the opportunity is still there for investors to get in. Um, and with gold, of course, the risk is that if it's known that you have gold, it may be confiscated, as happened in even the land of the free, right? In the United States of America in 1933, presidential executive order was issued to confiscate the gold of of all people in America. Um, and, and so it's best to buy it anonymously. So there's no record that you have the goal, uh, the gold, but in many countries, they've now introduced ceilings to how much gold you're allowed to buy in cash without giving away your, your details. So that's something to keep in mind with gold. And otherwise, well, stocks, fare reasonably well normally in in an inflationary scenario obviously not all stocks so you've got the selection problem but you might want to go for indices and of course asset markets have been booming ever since you know sort of march last year i've been consistently um in my investor letters um telling people that you know stocks are quite attractive in in most markets it's a buy recommendation and that's worked out very very well Talking of gold, and you said about the price being suppressed artificially, why is that? And how, how are they doing it? The why, I think, is quite clear, because if gold prices go out of hand, then that's an obvious and historically also well-recognized warning signal that there's something wrong. So they're trying to cover it up? Um, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean... It's a warning signal, so you want to, you don't want that warning signal to go off, right? So you keep the gold price low, and then, you know, the the warning bell is not ringing. How are they doing it? Well, the the biggest owners of gold are central banks, mm -hmm. so there are ways of suppressing it when you are the biggest, you know, players in the in the market. Um, but apart from the outright sales, which is a sort of last resort, of, but even that has been practiced in the past, um, what you can do is use paper gold, essentially derivatives of gold, um, and, and try to manipulate the market. And it's quite well known that the der gold derivative transactions are a, a vast multiple of the underlying gold. And so a lot seems to be done through that as well okay okay um going on to commercial banks then in the whole credit creation process 
uh, something obviously you know a lot about, <laughs> having uh, pioneered it. Um, so if commercial banks don't need deposits necessarily to create credit, uh, someone's asked, why even take deposits? Aren't they just a liability to the banks? Well, of course, they're a liability to the banks. By definition, this is accounting, assets and liabilities, and deposits are liabilities. Um, and the answer to the question is that, well, that's how banking works, because if you, if you look at the legal side, it becomes easier to understand. At law, there is no such thing as a bank deposit. A bank deposit at law is simply a loan that the non-bank public is giving to the banks. That's what a deposit is. But we are using these loans to the bank as our money. Mm -hmm. And that's why the banks want to create, and they do create, when they create money, they do create these deposits out of nothing because that's the money we use and that's how you create the money so in other words the, the question is still based on the old financial intermediation theory where you think you know there's um banks gather deposits and then lend money and the function of deposits and and and, and the whole money concept underlining that is it's like it's for example like gold you have something properly there and you're lending it out, the deposits, and you're lending them out. But that's not at all the situation. It's just a record. Deposits are just a record, just numbers. Um, a record of the money that the banks owe the non-bank economy. But we're using these records as our money supply. And so because of that, banks want to, they want to create more of that. You know, that's, that's how banking works. And you create it when they, the banks purchase assets, such as your loan contract that you've signed, which is on the asset side of the balance sheet. I hope that answers that question. I'm going to dig you a little bit deeper um, because I think I, I sort of get where, they, where they're coming from here. So you don't need the deposit as money because you're not moving money from one account to another person's account when you give out another loan as a bank, when you create new credit. You're not moving money from one account to another. So what well, money mean? doesn't move, but credit entries in, you know, as bank liabilities, what we call deposits, they do move between, or let's rather say the, uh, the ownership moves, you know, um, and so you do make changes in this record. It's a ledger that you do change. That's how, you know, transfers of money are being made. Okay. It's, probably easier once uh, we we release that video going into more detail about the uh, actual um accounting method used by the bank and how the balance sheet grows it will probably be easier for everyone then to to see how the deposits are used um so no worries <laughs> um talking about primary dealers then so in the u.s primary dealers are sort of the market makers for the fed are all primary dealers banks or are some of them non-banks um well i couldn't say whether some are non-banks, but they have bank-like functions. Um, and also they have to follow, um, you know, the respective rules. Um, I, I don't know whether the different types, I would have thought they're all the same type, the primary dealers. Okay, so if they are banks then, because obviously some of them are definitely banks as we know, um, when they are purchasing the US Treasury securities, are they creating credit for that purchase? When they're purchasing it directly from the Fed? Um, well, if they're working as intermediaries and they're immediately selling them on, then it, it, it almost doesn't matter because the moment they sell them on, the money creation disappears. Okay. And certainly for a lot of the transactions, they are acting as, you know, somebody who's just buys it briefly and then sells it on. And so for that purpose, well, it's irrelevant because it's, um, I mean, as banks, they would create money, but they immediately destroy that money creation again. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, how to bring down EU SSR by raising above it? Someone's asked. By, by raising, sorry, what? By raising above it. 
So I'm guessing they mean um, morally, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, not sure what they're getting at that question. I don't know if you can work it out. It's all right. We'll uh, yes. <laughs> we'll <start> uh, <laughs> no, well, um, that's okay. No, um, how to get rid of the EU SSR? Well, I mean, it's been one of my contentions that the EU has become very much like a Soviet Union. Mm. And there seems to be a Russian author, and I've, I've actually never seen the book, it's, I've only heard it referred to, who makes this explicit comparison between the EU institutions and the Soviet Union, and identifies that there's, I mean, it's, it's completely the same. So the Politburo of the Communist Party um, is the the Politburo is the um, European Commission because it's unelected, but has all the power. It's this sort of structure. And that's, it's an unusual structure because it's not democratic. Right. Where you have a, a sort of an inside group of powerful functionaries, apparatchiks, the Politburo, controlling everything, but pretending it's a democracy. So that's exactly the EU structure where the Politburo is the European Commission, and they propose laws, they table the laws. Whereas normally in a democracy, it's Parliament that does that. And there should be a strong role for Parliament in democracy to debate, to change, uh, to table laws and, and you know, uh, council laws, all that. But in the EU, just like in the Soviet Union, it's entirely the you know, the European Commission, the, the Politburo that does that, and members of the so-called European Parliament de facto have no power to propose laws. Most people don't know that, and they talk about, oh, it's a democracy, and yeah. you know, we've got European Parliament, and of course, the way to get over this is just to bribe everyone. So parliamentarians, uh, you know, members of European Parliament, they paid so much money, you won't believe it. So they never complain, oh, we don't like the system, there's a problem here. Well, you know, while the, the money's coming in and tax-free, you know, huge amounts of money every month for every one of them. And so nobody complains and they're quite happy. See, so if you want to make a lot of money, join the European Parliament. <laughs> Basically. Yes, and so, so that's... So, yeah, the answer to the question is that it is an EU um, SSR because it's the Soviet Union. And of course, they're moving now in the banking sector to introduce the Soviet style monobank system. Gosbank was the, the central bank, was the only bank, which very much looks like the plans of the ECB because it's already killed 5,000 banks since it got started. And it's certainly heading for more killings. Um, with its um, outrageous monetary policy, because uh, you know, if you wanted to kill banks, um, then the best policies combination you could adopt is just exactly what the ECB has been adopting um, in the past, um, you know, two decades. And those are those are um, so since two thousand eight, the policy to. Um, lower interest rates on the long end and the short end, flatten the yield curve, invert the yield curve and push it to zero or negative territory uh, so that the banks that do the credit creation for productive purposes, which is the useful form of bank activity that is also sustainable and should be encouraged, those banks have to shut down, they have to merge um, they can't survive because they're not making money on that. Whereas those banks that do the speculation, the Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley's, they get fully encouraged. They just borrow the negative interest rate money and speculate in asset markets. Um, that's um, what's being encouraged. I see. And so lower interest rates. Why do lower interest rates hurt banks so much then? Just for anyone who's well, not Banks aware. get their money from the the profit margin they have over you know the the interest rate charged on their loan customers over the interest rate they're paying um those who have deposits at the at the bank so that's the profit margin um which essentially is reflected in the yield curve and if you've got a flat yield curve then you don't have profits um and an inverted yield curve is even worse 
And then if the whole thing is a negative territory, that's also not helpful for banks. And also, am I right in thinking that ECB has whacked up some more charges as well on how much it costs to be regulated well, by them? Well, exactly. I mean, that's the other point. The cost of regulation have increased massively since the ECB arrived on the scene, um, as is predictable because there's still the old types of bank regulators. And on top of that, we now have the ECB. Um, and it's been a huge burden on smaller banks that they simply cannot afford, so they have to shut down or merge with other banks. And on that subject, actually, someone said uh, the ECB is pushing its undemocratic climate change agenda in the name of sustainable finance. Does killing all banks in the Eurozone, leaving only the ECB in charge, meet the de definition of sustainable finance? Well, certainly not. I mean, that's yeah, highly unsustainable. Um, what would be sustainable would be a diverse banking sector with many, many small banks. But that's exactly what the ECB wants to destroy. Um, and that's official policy. It's not a conspiracy theory by any means because it's official. It's in the public statements. Previous head of the ECB, Draghi, uh, came out and said there's too many banks uh, in the Eurozone. And of course, the country he was speaking in at the time, Germany, is the country with by far the largest number of banks, namely not-for-profit community banks. Um, I don't think he was referring to the likes of Goldman Sachs, um, his alma mater, so to speak, um, that should disappear. So, yes. Okay, so we've got two opposing policies, really, then. They've got sustainable finance and the killing of banks. Um, yes. Now, this, this whole sustainable finance thing or green agenda... It's very strange because clearly the central banks in the past didn't care about this. Now they they claim that this is a, a major concern for them. But uh, it's, well, at least to some extent, it's likely to be just a cover. So how to educate kids and adults to practice financial wisdom, which is coincidentally what we've been discussing recently. Well, I think it's a good idea to to teach young people about finance but the question is what are we teaching them mm. and that's really been the problem because um what what has been taught at um at university has been mostly nonsense um and so if we now say oh we should teach younger people early about finance if it means just teaching them nonsense then obviously that's not really needed so the more important question is, what actually is it that we should teach? What are the facts? And then we can talk about, um, well, teaching that also earlier. Okay, great. Um, and then so to finish on, do you know a good course to study economic concepts, but are not designed to think wrong? So more like the course you obviously put on at the University of Southampton for me, or something similar like that, or any books you know that would be good for people interested. Yes. Well, I teach um, a master's in international banking and finance at De Montfort University um, in Leicester. That will be one I recommend. Um, I teach two modules there. Um, otherwise, there are some universities that still have um, modules and courses, programs in economic history. Um, and that may then also include history of economic thought. Um, and so um, these are important topics. They have been eradicated in many universities because anything to do with facts, you know, is, is a hindrance. Um, but if you find a course that is more fact-based, then that's likely to be more scientific. But the pressure is on almost all universities to conform to the mainstream. Yeah. So you have to look at essentially who is teaching there and then go somewhere where you know there's some people who are um, teaching fact-based stuff and not just made up hypothetical axiomatic nonsense. <laughs> okay, great. And then someone wants to know a little bit about your University of Southampton case. Can you say anything about that or is it quite... You have to be um, quite well, of there's a law case. Um, I was discriminated against for quite a long time period. And so, yes, I'm engaged in an in a employment tribunal case against my former employer. Um, I feel that um, my activities, my work um, that criticized concentrated banking systems um, was a key factor in this discrimination. 
Okay. Okay. And quick fire question, dog or cat, which do you prefer? <laughs> I like both, really. I mean, they're so different that you need to have both. One of each or, you know, they can get along well. Um, I used to come from a, a dog household, but then had a, a Japanese bobtail cat in, in Japan. And then we brought her over to the UK. And that was great, too. And they have so much character, you know, cats. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I like both. <laughs> okay. And McAfee? Uh, do you think there's something sinister around this suicide, apparent suicide? Well, actually, I have an opinion on things like that. Namely, and there's, I found there's a law in Germany which says that it's illegal, it's a crime to besmirch the reputation of a deceased person. So if somebody's dead, mm -hmm. it's a crime to give, to, to, uh, give them a bad reputation. Okay. Now, that's an important law. And in my view, this law means that you should never assume somebody is a murderer because that clearly is uh, one of the worst things you can be, a murderer. And uh, therefore, we should always assume that in cases of unnatural death, um, this was forced by others. And therefore, we should not just go around and say, oh, likely a suicide. Mm. Well, hang on. <laughs> you know, the guy is likely a murderer. Are you sure you want to say that? Yeah, it definitely would seem uh, not in keeping with what he was saying a few weeks before he, uh, he died. So... Mm -hmm.